Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we're continuing our ongoing coverage of the war between the Russian Federation and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and its N Ukrainian proxies. Now, <clears throat> the uh, as we speak, uh, the Kursk pocket uh, caused by the NATO Ukrainian incursion into the Russian Federation uh, Kursk Oblast uh, is continuing uh, to be crushed by Russian forces, and for whatever reason, the uh, the uh, political entity that resides in Kiev is continuing to mandate that Ukrainian forces defend to the very last man, and possibly a few women, the Kursk pocket. Now, is there any military, is there any strategic benefit to maintaining the Kursk pocket? Well, no, there's not. There's actually just the reverse. The cost in terms of the impact on the ongoing war and the ability of the Ukrainians to flex some of these brigades out of the Kursk pocket and have those brigades fight in other areas that are also uh, being enveloped and destroyed by Russian forces, they cannot be used because they're in Kursk. So again, cost versus benefit, the, the cost obviously is, is, is much higher, and there's very little benefit for Ukrainian forces maintaining its presence in Kursk. Now, at the same time, uh, we are seeing the Russian uh, Donbass offensive continue. Uh, we are seeing uh, offensive operations, successful offensive operations, uh, envelopment operations taking place just to the south by southwest of uh, Pokrovsk, uh, the Russians uh, continue to expand uh, this uh, this bulge or salient that pushes out towards uh, Prokrovsk. Uh, we are we are seeing that in a n number of locations. The uh, defensive works, the defensive operation near Selodov, has uh, has broken down. If we go here and we look at what has occurred over the last day or so near Selodov. Uh, you can see Russian forces have uh, enveloped and now have broken into this fairly large city and uh, are in the process of cleaning out Selidov. Uh, Ukrainian forces are also reportedly retreating uh, from this uh, frontline fortified city uh, as, uh, as, uh, as well. So uh, we'll have to uh, obviously continue to watch what, uh, watch what happens and uh, we will uh, continue to report uh, on... Uh, the events that are taking place in this area. Now let's go over here where you, the viewer, can kind of see what has happened over the last few days. So this is again uh, Pokrovsk, the uh, Pokrovsk salient, and then we'll kind of back out where you can see exactly what has happened. So just a day ago, you can see this Russian envelopment operation. Uh, look to the north, look to the south, and more importantly, finally, once this pincer movement occurred, you can see what has happened inside the town itself. So we'll zoom in a little bit, and we will simply uh, move forward. And there we are. So not a good situation for uh, Ukrainian forces uh, that are operating just to the south of the uh, Pokrovsk uh, salient. Additionally, Russian forces continue uh, offensive operations uh, within the vicinity of Volhadar. They continue to expand uh, after cracking the, uh, the Volhadar uh, fortified outpost. Again, we'll kind of back up where you either can see what has happened over the course of the last uh, several days as Russian forces continue to, uh, to push forward. So again, just to fast forward where you can see now, a lot of people go to these uh, these mapping services, and because they don't watch it daily, they uh, they believe that the the uh, the battlescape is not changing, but it is. And, and here we'll give you an example: uh, after breaking into Volhadar, breaking Ukrainian forces into Volhadar, and then we fast forward and clearly see just a methodical drive forward 
by Russian forces. So, yes, the Russian forces are continuing to make headway. Now, again, as I've talked about before, uh, this is not a war designed to, uh, with, the, with the primary focus of taking control of territory. What the Russians are doing right now, as I've talked about before, they are breaking the Ukrainian military. They are destroying the Ukrainian military. So instead of a, uh, eventually what is going to happen is you will see a rapid breakdown of the Ukrainian military. You'll see a rapid breakdown of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces, and then you will see very rapid uh, territory expansion by the Russians once that occurs. And look, we're seeing it all along the front lines. These uh, Ukrainian units that are being uh, enveloped and destroyed in a number of locales, very difficult situation for the Ukrainians. And you can see the way these attacks are occurring. So same uh, uh, modus operandi that you are uh, seeing uh, in, in an example uh, within uh, uh, Selidov and, and some of these other areas. Same strategy, same same, well, same tactic that is uh, is being used. Now, uh, we have uh, received word that apparently the Kremlin is acknowledging that North Korean forces could be present in the Russian Federation. Now, they've not come outright and said, hey, North Korean forces are present. What they are saying, the, uh, the, the leadership functionaries in the Kremlin, uh, Vladimir Putin, is essentially saying, well, it's, it's really none of your business. So, is it? is it? Is it any of the West's business that North Korean forces are present in the Russian Federation? Is it any Western nation-state's business that... North Korean forces may conduct military operations in Kursk. I would have to say probably not. Look, right now, as we speak, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the command and control of this ongoing war against and continuing against the Russian forces is being directed in Western Europe and quite possibly in the, uh, the Pentagon itself. When the Ukrainians launch strikes inside the Russian Federation, where do you think that intelligence is coming from? Do you believe the Ukrainians have satellites above the Russian Federation? Do you, do you believe that the Ukrainians have signals intelligence on par with what is being used by Western Europe and especially the United States? Absolutely not. So that intelligence, and intelligence in modern war, right, the ability to what they call sense and then followed by shoot, you can't shoot unless you can't sense a target. Those sensing operations, that ability to identify a target in a Russian rear area and understanding the impact a precision-guided weapon system striking that target would have on the battlescape, that information, by and large, is coming from the West. The West, NATO, the United States, is a direct participant in this conflict, probably much, much more than the average uninformed urbanite here in the United States fully understands. As I've talked about before, I believe it's highly probable that actual U.S. low-observable low assets have been used in this conflict, meaning manned United States assets have been used against Russian forces. I believe that's happened. I also, we also believe that the continued use of storm shatter cruise missiles and other long-range 
precision guided low observable weapon systems that have hit Russian targets originate from Eastern European nation states such as Romania and Poland. Again, we've talked about this before. These are aircraft that take off from Poland. They may or may not touch down someplace in the Ukraine. They then possibly take off again and then hit targets or launch their long-range cruise missile systems against Russian targets in eastern Ukraine and in the Russian Federation. That's what's happening. So, hey, you know, if the uh, if the Russians are are getting support from the North Koreans for a, a variety of different reasons and and again they have entered into this this alliance, obviously there's a very hostile relationship between the West and North Korea at the same time. It's probably benefiting the North Koreans more by having its forces deployed inside the Russian Federation. They're getting applicable skill sets. They are taking a group of its armed forces that have not been in any real conflict for a number of decades, and they are giving those forces experience. And this is, again, a very high-intensity warfare, especially in terms of drones, artillery, counter-battery counter fires, and, uh, and, and then ultimately some vicious, vicious uh, both urban and uh, infantry combat that is taking place in fortified uh, positions, attacking fortified positions. And, uh, and that's going to continue. Here in the United States, uh, got to look at this real quick. Got to got to cover it. Uh, there continues to be talk that uh, uh, things are not looking pretty for the uh, the upcoming election or post election. I uh, I am very concerned that this is a coronation process of the new figurehead. And that figurehead is the uh, the cackling twit, Kamala Harris. Figurehead. Look, most of you, some of you, have had the opportunity to watch the recent CNN town hall. Now, they actually pushed back and questioned her probably more than she had anticipated. And she was not able to answer any question. Just minutes of word salads, tiptoeing around all issues, not having any idea what to say. She, she is just completely out of her depths. She does not and is not qualified even to be the figurehead El Presidente of the current un-United States. Not even qualified to do that. And I think, uh, I think at this point, some individuals in Washington, in the uh, media, fully understand it's, it's this, this coronation process is going to have a really bad look and it's going to have ramifications. Now, the possibility that there is such an overwhelming pushback in terms of Americans coming out and voting that it could override the system in place that is designed to cheat the vote. We believe that the powers that be that is running the country right now has the ability to change the outcome of an election when it when it is moderately close, five percentage points. It is it is believed that they do not have the ability to change the course of the election if it is a landslide. Now, what's happening right now is they are now contingency planning 
what is going to happen if it's a landslide and how they are going to maintain power. How are they going to do that? How is the deep state going to maintain power? How is it going to do that? Now, yes, I said deep state. Now, I've worked for multiple federal agencies. There is a deep state. And if you have not been employed within the quote-unquote federal government, you just you really don't know what you're talking about. There is a deep state. So big concern about what is going to happen post-election, who is running the country right now, who is the, the, the decision makers as we continue this track towards global war, which we are still on, that has not been derailed, it still continues. So what's going to happen next? Well, we don't know. We are, we are heading into uncharted territory right now here in the United States. And uh, it, is, it is believed that after the election, things could get incredibly messy. We are going to see things in all probability that this country has never seen before. And they're preparing for it. So again, more to come. As always, thank you for joining us. Have a good day.